What do you know about Guantanamo Bay? What do you know about it? And I mean that unironically. What comes to mind? What comes to mind? If you are a listener from the United States, what comes to mind is probably a prison. The Iraqi war. The war on terror. Quote, unquote. The Bush administration. Torture. Terrorists. 9-11. Weapons of mass destruction. Quote, unquote. Right? What you know, what I know, what everyone knows in the year of our Lord, 2023, is that a lot of what was told to us about Guantanamo Bay and the war on terror and the purpose for Guantanamo Bay and our front in the Middle East was a lie. And I don't mean that in a conspiracy theorist way. I mean it in a we've read the documents way. I mean it in a literal look at what we've seen and what people have admitted to and and what everyone now knows, right? This is, it's the equivalent, okay, 20 years past from when the towers fell of us reporting on a historical event in an objective manner. That is a fact. There were no weapons of mass destruction. We did not have the evidence that there were any to the extent that was alleged by the Bush administration to garner support and to instill fear and to allow for the detention of individuals at Guantanamo who were what you and I were told, okay, were, quote, the worst of the worst. An exact quote from Donald Rumsfeld at the time. The worst of the worst, right? The highest level of people who were engaged in not only 9-11, but involved in Attacking the U.S. on our own soil and abroad when our troops touched down. Would you believe me if I told you that a large percentage of detainees at Guantanamo have never been convicted of a crime? Would you believe me that 92% of the detainees at Guantanamo are not al-Qaeda fighters. They are not terrorists. They have not been proven to be. And there's actually no evidence that they are. Would you believe me that a large percentage, 86% of the detainees at Guantanamo, were sold to the United States for a bounty? Would you believe me if I told you that only 5% of all Guantanamo detainees were ever picked up on a battlefield in the Middle East or elsewhere? 95% were not. Would you believe me if I told you that many of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay uh, were teenagers? boys, carpenters, woodmakers, taxi drivers. Would you believe me if I told you that many of the Guantanamo detainees had never actually held a weapon? They were not high up in any Al-Qaeda intelligence form. Again, 92% 
of the detainees at Guantanamo were not Al-Qaeda fighters. Weird, right? And for the most part, even though so many reports, right, came to light later, human rights conventions, international tribunals, right, came later to denounce the United States in everything it was doing at Guantanamo Bay and to detail horrific torture at the hands of the freest country in the world, America, at its base at Guantanamo Bay. What we called, what the United States called enhanced interrogation techniques has only ever been called everywhere else but in the U.S. torture, human rights violations, right? We've seen the reports. You know what I'm talking about. But what many people haven't grasped and what I'd like to help you guys grasp a little more is who exactly were these people held at Guantanamo? And actually, I'm going to modify that. Who exactly are these people? still held to this day at Guantanamo Bay. Even when I, as a younger person who was not a practicing barred attorney yet, right, wasn't even a law student yet, even when we were hearing about these horrific instances of torture and and enhanced interrogation, quote-unquote, and abuse over years and years and years without a trial, right, no judge, no jury, no indictment, no conviction. The rationalization that all of the, you know, patriotism, propaganda of the early 2000s immediately instilled in us was, well, they're terrorists, right? Even if you thought, yeah, this is horrible and heinous, the assumption and the rationalization behind that was, well, yeah, we probably, you know, probably overdid it with the human rights bios, but look at the towers. Look how they fell. Look at the terrorists. We had to get them, right? They're everywhere. They're the worst of the worst that we're holding at Guantanamo. That, that, the worst of the worst in the world that we could capture that were definitely part of these terrorist groups, um, we had to hold somewhere and we picked them to be held at Guantanamo for a reason, right? For a reason. But in the context of America, right? And the United States of America and its self-proclaimed supremacy on constitutional rights, personal liberties, democracy, and freedom. Where does Guantanamo Bay fit? Why has this bay, this 45-mile stretch of land outside of Cuba, been known since it was opened as a legal black hole? When you heard about the torture and the detentions of so many people at Guantanamo, you probably thought, well, there's probably some complicated legal justification for it, right? There's probably some complicated legal loophole for it. There's probably some way that that I don't know about because I didn't go to law school that can justify this happening for the safety and national security of our country. Well, today I'm going to break that down for you. I'm going to break that down for you. One episode is not going to be enough for Guantanamo. Lordy Jesus, no. (laughs) But we're going to make it one. Because we're going to hit what what I think this podcast uh, should hit and and what I think is, is what I like to do, which is, you know, the spark notes. The legal spark notes, but also... The human spark notes 
of what Guantanamo has been for the lawyers, for the detainees, for the courts, the judges, and for our legal system as we know it. I'm not going to purport to say that I can even cover a single sliver of a piece of the pie of the human rights violations that were committed at Guantanamo that are still being committed at Guantanamo, potentially. Um, but this, I feel, is a good summary of it. It is from um, a, a paper that was published in 2018. States Guantanamo Bay and Human Rights, the legal status of Guantanamo Bay detainees. This heading states the reports of violations of human rights, okay? And these all have citations to legitimate reports. By 2005, America had captured 83,000 suspects, mainly men and male children from Afghanistan, 779 of which were imprisoned and interviewed at Guantanamo Bay. However, it is now known that torture has been used against these detainees. Many of the released AT detainees claim that torture was a regular part of their imprisonment, including trigger warning, beating, whipping, waterboarding, sleep deprivation, sexual humili humiliation, and forced exposure to graphic pornography. The camps also employed psychiatrists and psychologists to enhance the mental torture and to extract the detainees' phobias to be used against them. In 2006, the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association issued statements that restricted the participation of its members during interrogation, claiming that this was unusually cruel and inhumane treatment. They literally were like, no, you can't do this. In late 2002, Guantanamo requested permission to strengthen interrogation techniques that went well beyond those limits, despite recommendations from the Convention Against Torture warning the U.S. not to use these techniques. De Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld ultimately authorized this. The United States claims that the detainees of Guantanamo Bay are amongst the most dangerous people in the world, including bomb makers, terrorist financers, terrorist trainers, and recruiters, and potential suicide bombers. The U.S. makes further suggestions that these people are, quote, locked boxes containing information that could save thousands of lives. Therefore, it does not matter how many or how these boxes are opened. However, after the 2002 interrogation techniques were enhanced, their protocol changed in 2003 and they were enhanced again. With approval gained for 24 further techniques, including manipulation of diet and environment, sleep adjustment, and leading detainees to believe that they were being returned home to face torture or death, also known as the false flag. There have been reports of detainees being kept in solitary confinement in a cell flooded with light for 24 hours a day, which resulted in a detainee suffering extreme psychological torture, which left him crouched in a corner naked, talking to people who did not exist. A further report leaked by military staff at Guantanamo Bay revealed that a further camp had been opened in 2006 named Camp 6. This camp contains sealed cells, which do not allow natural light or fresh air, a technique named separation, which is permitted, though subject to the special authority under the newest version the U.S. Army field manuals. Currently, right now, on June 12, 2023, there are 30 detainees being kept at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. They are the 30 of the initial 780 detainees that have been held at the military prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba since 2002. Of the 30 that remain, 11 have been charged with war crimes in the military commission system. 10 are awaiting trial and one has been convicted. I'm going to read to you guys part of the introduction to the book called The Guantanamo Lawyers, which was published in 2009 by, as you can guess, the very select group of attorneys who ultimately fought to represent the Guantanamo detainees. Quote, following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, the United States imprisoned more than 750 men at its naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The prisoners ranged in age from teenage boys to elderly men. They were seized from more than 40 countries around the world 
some from Afghanistan, others from places as far flung as Bosnia and the, and the Gambia. Many had wives and children, and the prisoners had some other things in common. They were all detained for years without charges, without trial, and without a fair hearing. They were all denied any legal status or protection because President Bush had unilaterally declared them, quote, unlawful combatants. They were all held in secret and denied communication with their families and loved ones. Most, if not all, were subjected to extreme isolation, physical and mental abuse, and in some instances, torture. Many were innocent. None were provided an opportunity to prove it. These are their stories. The stories are told by their lawyers because the prisoners themselves were silenced. From the moment the prisoners first arrived at Guantanamo shackled and hooded in January 2002, the U.S. government prevented them from communicating with the outside world. The United States initially refused even to reveal the prisoners' names. No one knew who was at Guantanamo, why they had been imprisoned there, or how they were being treated. The public knew only what the Bush administration told it, quote, that the detainees there were all hardened terrorists, quote, the worst of the worst. It took lawyers more than two years and a ruling from the United States Supreme Court to finally gain the right to visit and talk to the men held at Guantanamo Bay. Even then, the lawyers were forced to operate under severe restrictions designed to inhibit communication and envelop the prison in secrecy. In time, however, lawyers were able to meet their clients, observe their suffering, and begin to describe to the world the truth about Guantanamo. To date, this is still true in 2023, to date, lawyers remain the only people other than government officials and representatives from the International Committee for the Red Cross who are bound to confidentiality to see or speak to the Guantanamo detainees. Lawyers have remained on the front lines in the long-running struggle to bring justice to Guantanamo, a battle that has been waged both inside and outside courtrooms, at home, and abroad, for now, over 10 years. Ironically, lawyers were never meant to go to Guantanamo. I wonder why. After September 11, the Bush administration was looking for a place to bring prisoners captured during the U.S.-led military invasion of Afghanistan, many of whom were sold to the United States for a bounty, as well as prisoners seized elsewhere in connection with the so-called, quote, global war on terror. The administration believed it had captured many dangerous people and wanted to find a place where it could detain and interrogate them without restriction or interference. It also wanted a place that would be beyond the reach of the courts or the Constitution. So it chose the United States Naval Base at Guantanamo Bay, an approximately 45 square mile area at the eastern end of Cuba. Although Guantanamo Bay still formally, officially, technically belongs to Cuba, the United States has for more than a century maintained total and exclusive control over the territory through a series of lease agreements that were negotiated after the Spanish-American War, early 1900s, okay? Under the agreements, that United States control is effectively permanent, lasting as long as the United States wishes to occupy the territory. Bush administration officials thus saw in Guantanamo the possibility of creating an enclave over which the United States exercised complete dominion and control but whose formal status as, quote, Cuban territory would place it beyond the reach of any court and beyond the reach and extension of the constitutional rights that, un that the United States affords its own citizens abroad, but not to foreign nationals not in the United States. Administration officials also believed that by labeling Guantanamo detainees enemy combatants, it could hold them at Guantanamo indefinitely, potentially for life, without charges or a trial. At the same time, the Bush administration made a series of determinations that the prisoners at Guantanamo, as well as others held as enemy combatants in the, quote, global war, war on terror, 
were not entitled to any protections under American or international law, including under the Geneva Conventions, which were intended to ensure that no prisoner would be outside of the law. The irony. The book, The Guantanamo Lawyers, describes itself as this, quote, It is impossible to capture Guantanamo fully in one book. This book is no exception, but as a collection of stories meant to reflect the experience of habeas attorneys and their clients, the detainees, through the process of the Guantanamo litigation, the book's cumulative perspective offers an exceptional point of view. What is ultimately most striking is the passion of the story's individual expression, poetic, ironic, somber, and occasionally dryly amusing. These stories constitute only a fraction of the experiences of the men who have been imprisoned at Guantanamo. Yet through these accounts, we hope to provide a fuller picture of some important events during the struggle to bring justice to Guantanamo and to give voice to the experiences of the detainees. The book's goal is to create a historical record of Guantanamo's legal, human, and moral failings and to provide a window into the United States' catastrophic effort to create a prison beyond the law, disdainful of its own best traditions and world opinion, a failure that will take many years to repair, even after the doors of the prison are finally shuttered. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, today, those doors are still not shuttered. Almost 15 years after this book was published, those doors are not shuttered. Not only are those doors not shuttered, as I stated, 30 prisoners out of the initial 750 to 780 prisoners that were initially brought to Guantanamo in early 2001 to 2003 are still being detained there right now as you listen to this podcast. The most recent court ruling on the subject of Guantanamo Bay detainees issued last month in the DC circuit. The title of this news article reads, quote, DC circuit orders due process analysis for Gitmo detainee. Quote, the full DC circuit has reversed part of a 2020 panel ruling that a Guantanamo Bay military prisoner who is being detained indefinitely for supporting al-Qaeda, lacks any constitutional due process rights and ordered a lower court to revisit his substantive due process challenge to his ongoing imprisonment. Tuesday's ruling reverses part of an August 2020 panel opinion authored by U.S. Circuit Judge Nimoy Rao, which found that al-Hela was an enemy combatant with no ties to the United States who therefore could not challenge his detention through procedural or substantive due process claims. This was last month. The constitutional rights and lack thereof of Guantanamo Bay detainees have quite literally been ongoing, litigated for 20 years. There has not been a solid resolution in the courts on whether and to what extent they even have rights. Almost all of the detainees that I told you about, right, the around 750, 780 detainees, you might be thinking, well, that number dwindled, right, to 30. Well, yeah, because most of them were just transferred somewhere else after years and years of torture. But even then, it didn't mean that they were they were vindicated or that they were told, oh yeah, no, our bad, you had rights. There has been nothing solid, solid, solid to give them in terms of a due process right. There have been a handful of Supreme Court rulings that have issued about Guantanamo Bay and its detainees and their rights to habeas corpus proceedings, due process rights, et cetera, that have happened since Guantanamo Bay opened that I would, I would even argue to say have been the only things, the only orders, the only legal standing issued to grant these detainees anything 
other than a military tribunal, I say that in air quotes, which is notoriously very secret, and obviously they're just rubber stamping convictions on there, right? Not actually, right? Who's you're being convicted by your jailer, right? Like be that that was what was happening. The United States Supreme Court and the DC Circuit, and the reason why the DC Circuit, as in the you know, the DC Circuit, one of our federal circuits, the reason why they have been the only ones who've issued opinions that have been so pivotal in in lawyers being able to even scrounge up a shred of a sh- of a sliver of a right to to even petition for for Guantanamo Bay detainees to be released is because the proximity to the DC circuit right it, it essentially covers it geographically that's where you would petition okay from Q at DC circuit okay and then it would be appealed up to the Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court um, you know, has handed down a few cases since Guantanamo Bay opened, but it wasn't even until 2008 in the case of Boumediene versus Bush where the Supreme Court really even held that they, these detainees had, had the same rights that a deta- detainee could potentially have who was being held in the U.S. Because Cuba, right, the, the, the Guantanamo Bay um, base, it finally held, quote, in every practical sense, Guantanamo is not abroad. It is within the constant jurisdiction of the United States. Right? But again, Guantanamo Bay has maintained and persisted as a legal black hole. And I'm going to detail why. In another excerpt from the book, The Guantanamo Lawyers, the firsthand account of attorney P. Sabin Willett. This excerpt is from his experience, his firsthand experience, walking onto Guantanamo Bay for the first time after two years of wondering who the fuck is over there, right? Who is at Guantanamo anyway? Quote, that's what I was wondering one hot day last July when I walked across a prison yard so silent and sterile as to be a little eerie. Nothing grew in the yard, no grass or flower or tree or even weed. We approached a hut. Inside was a man chained to the floor. His name was Adele. My firm had filed a habeas case for him the previous March, but I'd never seen him or spoken to him before. Was he a terrorist? One of the worst of the worst? Three weeks before I got to Guantanamo, Vice President Cheney said, quote, the people that are there are people we picked up on the battlefield, primarily in Afghanistan. They're terrorists. They're bomb makers. They're facilitators of terror. They are members of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, end quote. Something was off right from the first minute. Something about the young man's gentle smile, his calm didn't fit. On that day last July, I discovered what President Bush and his lawyers at the Justice Department had kept secret from the public and even from the courts. The military had concluded that Adele was innocent. I repeat, the military had concluded that Adele was innocent. Already at that point. Not a terrorist. Not an enemy soldier. Not a criminal. He had never been on a battlefield. He had been sold to U.S. forces from the soil of Pakistan, a nation with whom we had never been at war. Vice President Cheney says that Adele and men like him were picked up on the battlefield, but according to a 2005 study conducted by Seton Hall School of Law, 5% were picked up on the battlefield. 95% of detainees at Guantanamo were not. How did we get the rest? We distributed leaflets with smiling Afghan individuals declaring, quote, get wealth and power bond beyond your dreams. You can receive millions of dollars helping the anti-Taliban forces catch Al-Qaeda and Taliban murderers. This is enough money to take care of your family, your village, your tribe for the rest of your life. Pay for livestock and doctors and school books and housing for all of your people. 
86% of the Guantanamo detainees were sold to the United States by people who got those flyers. Vice President Cheney says that these men are all Al-Qaeda fighters. What does the data show? 8% are Al-Qaeda fighters. 92% are not. Vice President Cheney says they committed hostile acts against Americans or their allies. What does the data say? 55% of the detainees committed no hostile act against the United States or its allies or anyone else. By the way, Cheney and other Bush administration officials construed the term hostile act extremely broadly, as you can imagine. Fleeing from bombing by U.S. forces is a hostile act. Being sold to U.S. forces is a hostile act. Possessing a Kalashnikov rifle is a hostile act. It has been estimated that there were upwards of 10 million Kalashnikovs in Afghanistan in 2001 and only 8 million adult males. An adult Afghan male who hadn't possessed a Kalashnikov was harder to find than an adult Texan male who hadn't possessed a hunting rifle. If you walked into a restaurant in Kabul, you found Kalashnikovs hanging on the coat rack. For 60% of the detainees, the only hook by which they are deemed enemy combatants is that they were, quote, associated with the Taliban. But you have to understand that in 2001 in Afghanistan, the Taliban was pervasive, except in a few strongholds of the Northern Alliance. They controlled every village, every town, every guest house. If you traveled to Kabul and stayed in a guest house, you associated with the Taliban. If you were conscripted against your will into a Taliban militia, you, quote, associated with the Taliban. For two Saudis held at Guantanamo, their association with the Taliban is that the Taliban held them in prison as enemies of its regime. I am not making this up. Who was at Guantanamo? Who were the 780 that were kept there? They were privates. They were orphans. They were the poor. They were the conscripts. They were the cooks. They were the drivers. What about the mayors, the ministers, the Taliban generals? Well, guess what? They're, they weren't there. No, they were not. Take Syed Ramatola Hashemi. He joined the Taliban as a young man. He became a party spokesman. Osama bin Laden came to his office. Is Ramatola at Guantanamo? No. Mm -mm. He is a freshman at Yale. At the time that this excerpt was written by this Guantanamo attorney, that former Taliban party spokesman was a freshman at Yale University. Some of his former Taliban colleagues are now in the Afghan parliament that the United States helped create. The desperately poor kids they employed as drivers and cooks sit in Guantanamo. The last lie, the whopper, the huge one, is that Guantanamo Bay holds terrorists. President Bush, Vice President Cheney, their amen chorus in the Senate, they all tell you relentlessly that pe these people are terrorists. But when you review the data, when you search it for anything remotely like a ter terrorist attack, a terrorist attack defined as an act of violence against persons or property for bombing or bomb making or the teaching of bomb making or the fundraising for it, you find that that is most of all who isn't at Guantanamo Bay. If there is anyone at Guantanamo who conspired in the 9-11 murders, then I would like to see him tried. All that we lawyers have been asking for since the beginning is a hearing, a chance to show whether someone really is a, quote, enemy combatant or not. And when Guantanamo cases have come up for an actual hearing, like Shafiq Rasul's, what happened after his case came under Supreme Court scrutiny? They released him. What happened to Moa Zembeg, another, quote, worst of the worst? They released him. Mamdu Habib, when the story of his tor torture in Egypt surfaced, they released him. 
They told us these people were the worst of the worst, and yet rather than prove it, rather than protect you and me from them, they released them before a judge could see any facts. The Nazi war criminals were tried in the sunlight, and the world has never doubted the judgment at Nuremberg. But in no Guantanamo habeas case has President Bush been willing to let a federal judge hear a single fact about the worst of the worst. Instead, in the name of the, quote, global war on terror, the president can seize anyone anywhere in the world and transport him to Guantanamo Bay, where he may be held without criminal charge or process. The president may do so even after he has determined that the person was taken by mistake, as in Adele's case, and hold him as long as the, quote, war on terror lasts. So I want to ask you a question. How long will the war on terror last? That is the end of the excerpt I have read from the book, The Guantanamo Lawyers, an excerpt written by P. Saban Willett, one of the very first attorneys who were ever permitted on Guantanamo Bay. To give you context about why Guantanamo Bay has been a legal black hole for two decades, okay? Secrecy has been the default status for most of the proceedings, even remotely related to the war on terror, quote unquote, since the attacks on September 11, 2001. And the habeas corpus cases of Guantanamo detainees have been no exception. Dating to the Bush administration's efforts to avoid defending its detentions in court. Now, to understand what a habeas corpus proceeding is, okay, I'm going to give you that context, don't worry. You've probably heard that term a lot, right? And probably wondering, well, what's the difference between habeas and versus just a trial, right? Criminal prosecution. Criminal prosecution is defined as a criminal proceeding in which an accused person is tried, okay, before a judge, before a jury. The United States Constitution affords criminal defendants a variety of rights, including the rights to a jury trial, and grand jury indictment proceedings, the right against self-incrimination, and the right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment, to name a few. In criminal prosecution, the United States government has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the alleged crime in order to hold them or try them or sentence them, right? Habeas corpus proceedings differ from criminal prosecution because habeas corpus is a civil remedy that protects individuals from illegal executive detention. The suspension clause of the Constitution and the federal habeas corpus statute guarantees the writ of habeas corpus. All United States citizens detained by the United States anywhere and any non-citizen detained in the, quote, sovereign territory of the United States have the constitutional right to a writ of habeas corpus. Additionally, in habeas corpus cases, the United States government carries the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence that it's de- that a detention is lawful. So, the bulk of the Constitution applies to United States citizens when they are outside the sovereign territory of the U.S., with some exceptions. The United States Supreme Court has consistently held that non-citizens are not afforded constitutional rights outside of the sovereign territory of the United States. This began with the case of Johnson v. Eisentrager, a case decided by the Supreme Court in 1950. After detainees, prisoners of war, okay, of World War II, tried to sue based on, right, federal petition for habeas corpus, to claim that their detention was unlawful. They never got a trial, right, jury, anything, because they were convicted by a military tribunal which did not afford them all of the rights that they are owed, okay, that are due. In that case, the court held that no, non-citizens do not have access to United States courts during times of war. And therefore, non-citizen enemy combatants were not afforded the right to a writ of habeas corpus. Notice, okay, that when I'm telling you that, you know, enemy combatants are being held, okay, whether it be like post-World War II, in that case, in the Johnson case, or in these cases, the Guantanamo litigation cases, okay, in the enemy combatant cases, the difference between the quote-unquote 
proceedings that these enemy combatants are thrown in when they get there, okay, or how they're even booked into the system. And a federal writ of habeas corpus is that whatever military tribunal, okay, tried them, and I do the most aggressive air quotes in the world. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see them like, holy shit. The military tribunal that tried them, right, is like I said before, your jailer trying you for crimes they think that you already committed without any evidence. And again, these military tribunals are completely secret. They afford you limited to even no, none of the rights that you should be afforded, um, you know, as either a non-citizen on United States soil or territory that United States controls or as a United States citizen period, right? These tribunals are also very secret. They're super secret, okay? And, uh, you know, if you didn't notice, these tribunals delay, right? They're not, they're not really making decisions ASAP Rocky fast. And also the Bush administration in several since released documents, okay? highly classified documents that were released later on. Um, these officials, including Donald Rumsfeld, stated literally, quote unquote, this is a rubber stamp process. This military, These military tribunals that we're creating are rubber stamps of just conviction, 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 right? Let's get into what these military tribunals were like, okay? Because obviously me just saying these military tribunals tribunals were a piece of shit, right? They were nothing. Um, that's not really going to convince y'all. So here you fucking go, okay? Those that were housed at a small naval base in Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, from 2002 onwards, would be tried by a military tribunal system specially designed for prosecuting terrorists and punish, punishing violations of the law of war. Because the tribunal system, later called the military commission system, offered far fewer protections than those found in the U.S. criminal court system or the military's courts martial system, it was immediately controversial among legal academics and civil liberties groups. Its early history was marked by mass resignations among commission prosecutors and by allegations that the legal process was being used as a vehicle for political expedience only heightened the controversy. Do you guys understand how much it takes for a fucking military prosecutor to resign out of protest and shame and morals? Do you have any idea how much that would take? How much that would take? And it's not just, I know it's like not just the torture, as if the torture could even be described as a just, right? But what I'm telling you is that, again, I cannot stress enough, these people were not terrorists. The grand majority of them were never terrorists. And we knew that. The prosecutors knew that. That's why they were resigning. Although the military commission system was established in 2001, the first charges were not even issued until February 2004. Initially, the commission proceedings were conducted largely in secret. However, such secrecy, in addition to abbreviated due process protections, quickly led to allegations that the commissions were designed only to convict suspected terrorists. No shit. These criticisms were fueled by the 2004 resignation of four JAG lawyers from the Office of Chief Prosecutor, all of whom alleged that the then chief prosecutor of the military commission system, that was my cat, Fred Borch, had openly acknowledged that the commission trials were a rubber stamp process. My cat wasn't the chief prosecutor. He just made a noise. That's what, yeah. Rubber stamp process, meaning that you, you are presented before this commission and you're convicted, period. According to these prosecutors, Borch called a meeting of his prosecutorial team to inform that they, to inform them that they did not need to worry about acquittals because the commission panel would be, quote, handpicked. He further suggested that the prosecutors need only concern themselves with building a record for the review panel and for, quote, review by academics 10 years from now. Hi. Hello, that's me. You fucks. Questions had already, already been swirling about the legitimacy of the military commission system, and this controversy bolstered the widely held view that the commission system was designed not to dispense justice, but to convict without due process. Duh. 
After the Supreme Court invalidated the commission system in 2006 in Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, the Bush administration had limited options. It consequently turned to Congress for enabling legislation. During this time, allegations also surfaced regarding then-Defense Department General Counsel William J. Haynes II. Colonel Morris Davis reported that Haynes had attended his hiring interview in which Hartman had instructed Davis on which cases to prosecute first. Hartman had suggested Davis focus his efforts on, quote, sexy cases with, quote, blood on them for political reasons, namely to garner public support in advance of an election year. Davis, during that same meeting, referenced the likelihood of some acquittals in the commission system and recalled that Haynes's eyes went wide as he responded, quote, we can't have acquittals at Guantanamo. If we've been holding these guys for so long, how can we explain letting them get off? We've got to have convictions. Haynes tendered his resignation shortly after Davis made the conversation public. Davis later testified that other senior Pentagon officials, including Deputy Defense Secretary Gordon England, also made it clear to him that charging some of the highest profile detainees before elections that year could have strategic political value and urged him to take that course. Davis later provided similar testimony to Congress. Under the Bush administration, 28 detainees were charged, 14 were referred to trial, and ultimately three detainees were convicted and sentenced. Remember how many I said were there? 780. 28 were charged, 14 were referred to trial, and three were convicted. Yeah. At no point are any of these enemy combatants, when they're quote unquote convicted, in these military tribunals that we know barely anything about, um, are they even given lawyers that aren't just, you know, the jailers? Uh, they aren't given the right to communicate with anyone, okay? Right to appeal, anything. That's why the petition for a writ of habeas corpus, federal habeas corpus, that's why it's so important because a writ of habeas corpus claiming that your detention is unlawful, the civil right to claim, right, to basically sue and say your detention is unlawful, that goes to the federal courts. And the Bush administration knew this. That's why they tried everything they possibly could to prevent these detainees from being able to righteously file any petitions in federal court. That's why Guantanamo is this legal black. They created this legal black hole because their claim was, well, Cuba is not America and Cuba technically owns it. So uh, we're, we don't have to afford any of these people rights. We're not on U S soil one and two, we're in wartime and three uh, even if you say that they have to go through a proceeding, we're going to create these military tribunals to prevent them from claiming that they weren't they they weren't at least given something. Okay. Additionally, to avoid the issues that would come up with habeas corpus and the issues that would come up with these you know detainees, um, I don't know, seeking relief, and the issues that would come up with lawyers stepping foot onto fucking Guantanamo and saying this is a problem, right? The way that the executive branch and President Bush at the time tried to get around this was that immediately, okay, immediately, they had Congress on their side, right? In the wake of the September 11 attacks, as we know, executive power over national security became expansive. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, Congress passed the Authorization for the Use of Military Force, the AUMF, which gave the executive authority to the president, quote, to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Additionally, the president declared that Geneva that the Geneva Conventions did not apply to suspected terrorists because they were not entitled to prisoner of war status. Okay. Where's the logic? There wasn't. Therefore, the president was able to use all force he deemed necessary to find those suspected of involvement in 9-11 and to, and to detain them in any way he chose because the Geneva Conventions did not apply. This led, obviously, to captured, quote-unquote, combatants being detained at Guantanamo Bay because the government believed that habeas corpus review and other constitutional rights did not extend to non-citizens outside of the United States. However, as time passed, 
The judicial branch intervened to protect the rights of detainees being held there, specifically in the two years, right, after finally lawyers were able to put their little put their little feet on a Guantanamo, they were like, hold the fucking phone, bitches. We're going to try to fight this shit, right? They fought tooth and nail to get this shit before federal courts. They fought, okay? Specifically, the Supreme Court, okay, and mind you, right, when I say the Supreme Court step in, I mean the lawyers, the Guantanamo lawyers fought to even get these petitions to be first heard, right? They have to be heard by a federal court, the lowest court, district court, appealed to the D.C. Circuit, and then appealed up to the Supreme Court, okay? The first decisions that were ever issued about Guantanamo, by the time all this, you know, the first, like, Guantanamo lawyers rolled down, rolled up, and were like, sh- cut the fucking cameras, those decisions were issued in 2004, okay? The first two decisions of many later, Okay? Three years, at least three years, since Guantanamo opened its doors and since horrific torture and abuse of these detainees was happening, of these 780 detainees, okay, without anyone knowing, without them being able to communicate, without no one even knowing where they were, what their names were. They were just called detainee 047, detainee 048. Their lawyers who were litigating these two cases that I'm about to talk about in 2004, they're called Hamdi versus Rumsfeld and Rasul versus Bush. Their lawyers in the beginning of those petitions didn't even know the names of their clients before they were filing these. They didn't even know. They weren't allowed to know yet. In those cases in 2004, okay, in Hamdi, the court held that detainees were entitled to a, quote, meaningful opportunity to contest the factual basis for that detention before a neutral decision maker, the bare minimum, okay, which, again, does not rise to the level of, of due process, I'll tell you that much, but it's a little better than nothing, right? Additionally, in Rasul, second case of 2004, the court held that Guantanamo Bay detainees had a right to habeas corpus review, huge, because essentially at that point, okay, right, these lawyers were filing petitions for habeas corpus, like in federal court, and they were saying, they were denying them, saying, you don't have that. You have that, you don't have that right. Right, no standing, you're out. And then they appeal. Appeal, appeal, and we're hoping that the Supreme Court would, would say exactly that, okay? So therefore, the Supreme Court by 2004 attempted to grant certain rights to those detainees in Guantanamo. However, the Bush administration responded to those cases by implementing the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, the DTA, which stripped federal courts of jurisdiction over challenges by detainees and set up combatant status review tribunals, CSRTs, to review claims brought by by detainees. Because of course, right? Like your jailer is going to fucking tell you what, like, like, they're going to tell you super honestly and fairly whether you did the damn thing or not, whether your detention is unlawful, okay? So that's what's so sinister about all this to me when I look at the case law and the track record of like, you know, hey, (laughs) this illegal black hole. It wasn't some fucking loophole that Bush and his administration found back in 2001 that has just been a huge, well, what are you going to do for the next 20 years? Right? This has been a constant, constant rollback of that, right? Like 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 a re- constant fight, a fight by the lawyer in a W, and then the administration's response to say, "Fuck you. Oh no, fuck you. Oh no, fuck you, right? Even the fucking military tribunals. Do you guys understand this? It's not even just like a liberal, oh, liberal bl- blue-haired bullshit. you, they're terrorists, but not. The literal military tribunals who literally were the least fair motherfuckers of all fucking time were literally holding men like Adele chained and tortured after literally already deciding that he was innocent. Why? Because they could. They were like, why would we release you? 
They didn't want them to talk. They didn't want them to tell them about what was going on there. Do you understand? Like, that's why I'm like, this isn't, that's why it's just so, just, a, just, just, just obscene. I mean, look, it's just obscene to me when people play the whole, like, well, they were enemies card because like dead ass, they were fucking like, they weren't, they literally weren't. If the military fucking tribunal couldn't even prove that they were, when their, like, you know, fucking standard for proving that they were was literally, like, give me, like, some, like, good, like, hypos. You know what I mean? Like, give me, like, does he have a, does he have a mean smile? Like, <laughs> throw him in. Like, ugh. so after the first two cases about Guantanamo, okay, the very first, okay, Hamdi versus Rumsfeld and Rasul versus Bush in 2004, the Bush administration fucking responded, okay, implemented the Deta Detainee Treatment Act 2005, and CSRTs, which are these fucking bullshit tribunals, okay, to review claims brought by TDNEs. Their entire goal with this was because, oh, fuck, the Supreme Court was like, they're entitled to habeas corpus review. That means it would throw them into the federal courts, okay? And the federal courts are not the military. No, they are not. And the federal courts, in doing that, okay, in doing habeas corpus review would be like, hey, subpoenas, right? We'd get evidence. Like, lawyers would touch the fuck down. Right? More lawyers would touch the fuck down. And, and this would get national news. Evidence would come out. And the federal courts would be like, wow, what in the fuck? Right? They didn't want that to happen. So the Bush administration, in doing the, in passing the DTA and the CSRTs, they adhered technically to the Supreme Court's ruling that detainees must have the right of review of their detention while simultaneously circumventing the issue by creating military commissions that would afford this review rather than the federal courts. This issue of the right of review by the federal courts would come up again in 2006, okay, in the Supreme Court case of Hamdan versus Rumsfeld. In that case, the court held that the military commissions created by the DTA, okay, to try to, try to circumvent the rulings from 2004 were invalid. Okay, your dumb fucking military tribunals are fucking a joke and invalid because they did not comply with the Geneva Conventions and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The Bush administration then responded again by pushing Congress to pass the Military Commissions Act of 2006, which stripped federal courts of jurisdiction over detainee challenges and authorized military commissions to hear these claims. An ongoing battle. Every single time a new case is brought up to the Supreme Court, know that a lawyer had to file, petition, fight, district court, D.C. Circuit, Supreme Court. Like, that's why it's taking years. The most substantial Supreme Court case that was finally handed down that was basically like a, okay, be so fucking serious, okay, happened finally in 2008. Seven years. These, these detainees have been in psychological, mental, and physical Emotional torture, religious torture as well, for seven years. The issue finally came to a bit of a head in the case of Boumediene versus Bush in 2008. In Boumediene, the Supreme Court held that detainees have a constitutional right to habeas corpus review, that the DTA procedures were not an adequate substitute, no shit, and that, three, the MCA violated the suspension clause. Thus, it determined that federal courts do have jurisdiction over detainee habeas claims. Finally, Boumediene was seen as a win for detainee rights to habeas privilege, but the court made clear that the opinion, quote, did not address the content of the law that governs petitioner's detention and that the issue of what other constitutional rights must be afforded to Guantanamo Bay detainees was a, quote, matter yet to be determined. Lit. The ruling in Boumediene was quickly narrowed, okay, by, by subsequent D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals rulings that essentially eliminated the Boumediene holding, holding okay, by, by basically going back, by scaling back on that language, by saying, mm, well, citizens don't really have due process rights if they're outside of the United States. So, like, they can do the military tribunal thing. That's chill, right? That shit's chill. It's all good. Like, it's all good. And also, they can't really assert any substantive rights through habeas corpus petitions. Um, 
And the only right afforded to, to, to detainees was simply the right to habeas review, which is like the scantiest scant. Like it's not, they can't assert substantive rights through that review. It's literally just like the preponderance of the evidence standard for a detention, which is like such a low standard, very hard to even win, like right as a det- detainee to win on. Okay. Additionally, okay. And if you don't remember around this point, okay, by this point, okay. Boumediene is scaled back by a few D.C. Circuit decisions, okay, uh, limiting the rights of detainees to even have habeas review. This is now 2012. This is now 2012. Who was uh, voted in as president in 2008? Do you remember our first black president, Barack Obama, right? Also transitioning from a Republican presidency to a Democratic presidency and also transitioning to a president, Barack Obama, who affirmatively stated as part of his like campaign shtick, right, his whole fucking thing, that he was going to close Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay, because at this point, right, reports of of the heinous war crimes that had gone on, the the torture, civil rights, all that, human rights violations, like it had gone on. And he he said, you know what, I'm going to close this bitch. I'm going to close this bitch. Well, then he became president and he didn't do that. Mm -mm, No, he didn't. Because he was met with massive bipartisan attack they were like do not close that shit because again everyone was still believing and to this day people still believe the whole like there are terrorists there right where are we gonna put them when there weren't there weren't but obama uh caved and in 2012 okay the obama administration codified quote indefinite military detention without charge or trial into law by signing the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. Sick. And then finally, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals changed its fucking tune in the summer of 2019 in Kasim versus Trump. Note the years here that I just scaled through in like 30 fucking seconds, okay? The most pivotal cases that I just went through, the most pivotal Guantanamo cases that y'all need to care about, need to know, to understand the subject, to understand this legal black hole, have started started in 2004, and I've now jumped skippily do dot aid all the way to 2019. We've gone through, we're now with our third president. That's insane. And again, they've all primarily, almost all of them have just been chilling held, held there, okay? And, you know, fine, if you want to throw a fucking bone to Obama, um, many of the, the detainees who were held at Guantanamo, many of them were transferred out under Obama. But again, Guantanamo did not shut its doors. It did not shut its doors. It did not. No, it did not. Right. In Kasim versus Trump in 2019. Okay. The DC circuit court of appeals held that the DC circuit the D.C. District Court, okay, the lower court, erred in holding that Guantanamo Bay detainees have no due process rights. The court did not determine that Guantanamo Bay detainees had really any rights, stating that this was still an open question, but that, like, they probably had some, right? Like, or, like, you can at least, like, you can't say that they have no. You can't say they have no. We're not going to say they have some. You just can't say they have no, right? Because that makes fucking sense. Instead, the court merely explained that the D.C. lower court, okay, had read Supreme Court precedent on Guantanamo, okay, cases too broadly, and they had narrowed the ruling in Boumediene, okay, too much, too much, too much, Um, and that instead, okay, they reinstated the holding of Boumediene by clarifying that, quote, alien detainees must be afforded a habeas process that ensures meaningful review of their detention. Meaningful review is the buzz fucking word here. Okay. Buzz fucking word. Following the Kasim decision or lack of decision, right? Cause like, what is that? Like, thanks. Like you told me I, that I, that you couldn't say a judge couldn't say I had no rights, but you also didn't say I had any. Okay. The case of Ali versus Trump was finally argued in front of the DC circuit court of appeals again, also in 2019 Ali claimed that his indefinite detention was unconstitutional and sought relief a little differently. Changed, you know, his lawyers changed their tune. He sought relief under the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause, 
they had tried that before, but they had basically just been thrown the fuck out, right? You have no due process rights, like, but now they're kind of saying, okay, maybe there's, maybe we can get someone to say yes, right? Instead of just saying you can't say no, say yes. The district court initially dispensed with Adelie's case in a similar fashion as Kasim by relying on previous Supreme Court precedent to hold that the due process clause does not apply to Guantanamo Bay detainees. However, Ali's case differed because his case was not about access to classified evidence in order to dispute his detention, which before, okay, the military, right, at Guantanamo was basically like, we'll give you no fucking evidence. We're going to give you no access to any of the records we have. Yeah, go for it. Go, go have your fun habeas proceeding. Good fucking luck, right? You're going to have to prove that you need to be, that you're being held, right, in violation of your right. Good fucking luck, bitch. Like, good fucking luck, bitch. They, they tried a different angle here. They were like, oh no, we're not talking about the, ev- you know, the, the right to evidence to dispute my detention. I'm talking about specifically that Ali, okay, Ali's indef- indefinite detention was unconstitutional under the due process clause, period. Period. And also, in this case, argued that the due process clause does fucking extend to Guantanamo Bay. In May 2020, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals denied Ali's petition for a writ of habeas corpus because Ali's, quote, broad arguments that the due process clause applies, quote, in full to Guantanamo Bay detainees was, quote, foreclosed by previous precedent, basically saying it's a no. It's a no. Okay. However, in the opinion, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals noted that, quote, whether and which particular aspects of the due process clause apply to detainees at Guantanamo Largely, largely remain open questions in this circuit. Like they basically were like, mm, maybe. Okay, maybe. So the summary, you guys, and I know that's devastating for me to tell you that that's like kind of the summary. I'll tell you about the DC circuit case that just issued literally a month or two ago, okay, on this issue. The summary of the Guantanamo Bay legal precedent, this legal black hole that we have been swirling in, okay, unbeknownst to much of the public is that despite the Supreme Court consistently holding that Guantanamo Bay detainees have the right to the writ of habeas corpus, the court and other courts have not determined that Guantanamo Bay detainees are entitled to any other due process rights. Boom Dean, back in 2008, said, quote unquote, that to say that Guantanamo Bay is not part of the United States is asinine. It is under the full jurisdiction and control of the United States. That we've been new since 2008. Okay. The Supreme Court has held that. But because of this odd and weird legal black hole in between and the very much hot potatoing, right? of these issues back up and down and up and down DC circuit, Supreme court, DC circuit to this day, Guantanamo Bay detainees have never had a court tell them that they have due process rights. The only thing they've told them is the right to habeas corpus, writ of habeas corpus, I should say. In early February 2021, U.S. President Joe Biden declared his intention to shut down the facility before he leaves office, though the Biden administration has taken few steps in the direction of closure. Instead, the Department of Defense has continued several million dollars of expansions to military commissions and other Guantanamo Bay facilities, including a second courtroom. Amazing. Of the 780 people detained in Guantanamo since January 2002, when the military prison first opened after the September 11th attacks, 741 have been transferred elsewhere, 30 remain there, and 9 have died while in custody. So, you're probably wondering, well, what happened in that D.C. Circuit order, right, that issued like a month or two ago, okay? Specifically, the one that was issued April 4th, I believe 2023 and then reissued April 12th, 2023. Okay. What was that about? Was that another W? Kind of, kind of. Okay. One of the remaining 30 detainees, um, filed a petition. Okay. Habeas corpus and claimed, you know, my, my substantive due process rights are being violated. 
non-citizens that are in the United States on the United States territory are allowed to have constitutional rights. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, but I don't know if I stress that enough. Being on U.S. soil means that everyone has it. Okay. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen to have these rights. But again, okay, the, the legal black hole of Guantanamo Bay is that we have a 45 mile stretch of uh, potentially we're leasing, we're fucking tenants, allegedly, okay, of Cuba. It belongs to Cuba, not us. Who gives a shit? I give a shit. This ruling, okay, is kind of it is a W, okay, but it's a bit of a reaffirm of the prior D.C. Circuit ruling. In this ruling, um, the en banc appellate court directed a D.C. federal judge again, like I stated, to hold further proceedings. Basically saying that you can't just say that this man has no due process rights. He might have some, but we're not going to say whether he has some, but he just might have some. So, so they kick it back down to the short, to, to the lower court and say, um, yeah, you should, uh, you should consider whether he has no due, due process rights. But again, he's still being detained, right? He's still being detained. The majority of Guantanamo detainees were eventually released from detention without resort to the military commission process. The U.S. government initiated transfer out of Gitmo for many of the, of the detainees while others secured release by successfully punishing the D.C. District Court for writs of habeas corpus. So as soon as the Supreme Court, okay, in, in 2004, 2006, 2008, started saying, yeah, no, the petition for habeas right relief is, is yeah, they have that. Um, the detainees started doing that. They started petitioning and they started actually uh, get, getting their day, okay, getting their day. And what would often happen is that the, uh, you know, Gitmo peeps would see the writing on the wall when a petition was filed and transfer them out as fast as possible so that they wouldn't really, you know, they'd be like, oh, you were moved. Sucks. Okay. You know, they're off Gitmo, so what's the problem? Since 2002, roughly 780 detainees have been held at the American military prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Now, 30 remain. Of those, 11 have been charged with war crimes in the military commission system. 10 are awaiting trial and one has been convicted. In addition, three detainees are held in indefinite law of war detention and are neither facing tribunal charges nor being recommended for release. Another 16 are held in law of war detention, but have been recommended for transfer with security arrangements to another country. The New York Times has been maintaining a site called the Guantanamo Docket. It was last updated May 2nd, 2023. I highly recommend you look at it. The link is going to be in the show notes. It includes a complete list with biographies and photos of every single individual held at Guantanamo Bay, the nature of their detention, documents that are linked, that have been leaked or unclassified with respect to them. Okay, sometimes the transcripts from their quote unquote military commission hearings you will be able to see firsthand just how scant this shit is, right? With respect to the transcripts and the tribute, right? What evidence was used to even just keep them there? Many of them, right? It'll tell you they were picked up. They are picked up from everywhere, okay? They are picked up from Russia. They are picked up from Britain, Iraq, Morocco, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Jordan, France, Turkey, Egypt, the, nas the nationalities extend everywhere. Two decades of detainee operations. President Biden has renewed the Obama administration's effort to close the prison. Over the years, about 780 men were held there. The Bush administration transferred about 540, mostly to the custody of their home countries. The Obama administration arranged for the repatriation or resettlement of about 200 men in, nation in nations around the world. The Trump administration transferred one man to a prison in Saudi Arabia, and the Biden administration has repatriated five and freed one, reducing the total inmate population to 30 men today. Afghan citizens were most represented among the detainees over time. Many have been, had been handed over to the United States by allied Afghan and Pakistani security forces or early in the U.S. invasion meant to crush al-Qaeda and topple the Taliban, including nine who died in military custody. Nine. Several of those were those who were alleged to have committed suicide, though that is obviously up for debate. One detainee was sent to the United States for trial and is now serving a life sentence in federal prison in Kentucky. Only one. 
has ever had a trial as we know it. Again, regardless of the nature of their release, they were all subject to the same torture methods. Enhanced interrogation techniques. Again, most of these 780 arrived in 2002. Almost every, like a majority, like you scroll through this, it's 2002, 2003. Okay, they arrived. Many of them you click, arrived in 2002, transferred 2007. You click, arrived in 2002, transferred 2014. Around 2002, transfer 2006. I mean, in many tell-all books that some of the survivors of Guantanamo have have helped write, right, taken a part of, have said that they have lasting, lifelong medical problems because of the torture that they face. Many of which, right, with respect to kidney issues, for example, dying of kidney failure, they were forced to drink um, fluids, too many fluids, uh, almost to the point where, you know, you, you can pass away, for example, for drinking too much water. Those that try to go on hunger, hunger strikes were forced, uh, forced bed. The, those who tried to kill themselves were tortured even more, were kept alive. 710 detainees were transferred and are still alive. I encourage you, highly encourage you, to go look at the Guantanamo docket. It is updated frequently to ensure that Essentially, there's this bar at the very top that shows that 750 have been transferred and 30 are still held. One day that number will be zero. One day. My rebuttal today is not going to be my rebuttal. It's going to be a rebuttal from one of the Guantanamo Bay attorneys. One of the attorneys who represented these men. Remember when I finished off with this excerpt stating, quote, how long will the war on terror last? He says from the book, The Guantanamo Lawyers, quote, we need to acknowledge if we are thoughtful people that terror is everywhere and has been with us always and involves all kinds of people who later get called, quote, men of peace. My point is not that we should cease to fight terrorism. It is to ask, does anyone think he or she will live to see the end of terrorism? And thus the end of the global war against it. Do you think you'll watch on TV as the emperor of terror comes aboard a Navy warship to sign the instrument of surrender? When we say the president has special powers during the global war on terror, we are saying he has them forever. Always and forever can the president lock people up at Guantanamo without meaningful judicial review. Always and forever he can ignore the Congress's ban against torture as he vowed to do. Always and forever he can tap your phone, download from your iMac, and go snuffling through your trash. Always and forever, he can ignore the writ of habeas corpus. Now you might ask, why care about this? Why volunteer your time to represent these men? It's the war on terror, isn't it? So what if somebody is roughed up a little in the Kandahar or Bagram? There are horrors in Darfur and New Orleans. So what if a few Uyghurs pay the price? We have reservists from Vermont losing mortgages. Injustices abound in the world. Why care about this particular one? During the Vietnam War, a protester stood outside the White House with a candle. Every night for weeks, he stood in the cold, in the rain. One day, a reporter came up to him and asked, Do you really think with your candle you're going to change White House policy? No, he said, I'm sure I won't change White House policy. But that's not why I'm doing this. Then why are you doing this? The reporter asked. So that White House policy doesn't change me. Can I bring you any good news? Only a little. Adele's story made its way to the press and then to Sweden, where an Uyghur woman was living as a refugee. On July 28, 2005, I listened on a telephone as she wept. She is Adele's sister, and for four long years, she thought he was dead. You see, no one knows who is in Guantanamo. A few weeks later, with the help of some judicial pressure, we organized a very unusual event at Gitmo, a phone call between these two people, Adele and his sister. I saw Adele again late in August. After that call, a sleepy-eyed man had come to life. Before he told me, it was as though I had evaporated from the earth. A phone call. So small a thing. The Constitution, the rule of law, freedom, rights, personal liberties, privileges are not coming back on their own. It will come back only when we go out and grab hold of it by the ears and drag it back. In the ballot box, in the courtroom, in the newspaper, in the classroom, in the public street, can you remember where you were in January 2002? Think back. Now reflect for a moment on what has happened in your life since then. Where have you been? What have you done? Who have you loved? Who has loved you? 
Now imagine that none of those things in your life happen because like Adele, every single one of those days since January 2002, you have been cut off in a prison just outside the map of the world, even though the military determined there was no basis to hold you. And imagine the Congress of the United States voted to deny you the chance to ask a judge to make it right. So who is at Guantanamo? The truth is, the answer to that question is you and me until we shut it down and imprisons all of us. So far as I am able to discern what keeps these men from sinking into madness is a deep-seated faith and a passionate belief in their religion. Allah has willed their imprisonment, and when he wills otherwise, pursuant to his divine purposes, he will set them free. In the meantime, they take it day by day. This is a quote from Thomas P. Sullivan, a different attorney. My impression of the prisoners I have encountered at Guantanamo is shared by my partners who had visited our clients at the prison, as well as by the other fine lawyers for prisoners with whom we've spoken. We believe most of these men are not and never were criminals or terrorists, were not connected with Al-Qaeda, should not have been imprisoned in the first place, and if sent home would resume peaceful, productive lives, albeit damaged by the awful experiences they have endured during the past seven years. Remember, at the time that this was written, it had only been seven years since it opened. It has now been 20. But be they good or evil, these men are entitled to have their captor, the U.S. government, established before a fair tribunal a valid reason why they should be imprisoned. In the meantime, they take it day by day. This has been another episode of the Rebuttal Podcast. Thank you for listening. Think on these things. Think on the injustices, the biases, the acknowledgement of suffering. Remember that it took two years, two years in captivity for these men to be even acknowledged as people, for their names to even be heard by an attorney. Presence, acknowledgement, vindication. That's what that is. Our country recognizing our society, our people, regular people, and the public recognizing the suffering, harm, and horrors that result from policy, from our own policy, can really change the world. And these lawyers, these lawyers were doing the work that no one wanted to do at that time, especially at that time. If you were uh, an adult around the time of 9-11, you know. Do you think these lawyers uh, were respected in our profession? Do you think that people were cheering them on? No. Not in 2006, not in 2004, not in 2009, no. They shed light on these injustices. And I couldn't be prouder to be their colleagues. And I hope to be the next generation's Guantanamo lawyers one day. Again, we all hold a candle outside the White House. We all hold a candle outside of our schools, outside of our cities, outside of our homes. We all hold a candle outside of our prisons, outside of our public defender's offices, outside of our prosecutor's offices. We all hold a candle. We can't change policy with a candle, but we can refuse to let that policy change us. Have a lovely, beautiful, amazing day. Thank you for listening. This has been Rebuttal.